I welcome you all to um, the Clinical Science Research Club with um, Dr. Olani um, Taiwo and I'll be introduction about him. Dr. Olani Olufemi Taiwo is the esteemed director of the Intercountry Center for Oral Health for Africa, which is ICO, with a distinguished career in public health, clinical research, and dental surgery. He brings over two decades of extensive experience and expertise to his role. Dr. Taiwo holds a PhD in public health from Walden's University and MSc in clinical research from the University of Liverpool and a master's in public health from the University of Lagos. He is also a certified um, professional in medical genetics and genomics, bioethics and information technology. Dr. Taiwo has made impactful contributions in dental research, public health and epidemiology throughout his career. He has held numerous leadership roles, including um, chair of the IADR Ethics in Dental Research Committee, president of the IADR Nigerian Division, and the chairman of Nigerian Dental Association Plateau State. He was actively involved in training, and he is actively involved in training and academic service. He has been um, pivotal in oral health care training for primary health workers resident doctors and ICO programs. As director of ICO, he drives initiative in oral health research, community health, and clinical ethics, fostering a collaborative environment to enhance oral health across Africa. So it is my pleasure to um, welcome on board our speaker for today in person of Dr. Olani Tao. Kindly um, use the emoji to welcome him as he takes over the mic. So good evening, everyone, <clears throat> and uh, thank you, Titus Johnson, for that introduction. I don't know if uh, I've made a host or if I can share my screen. Let me see. Yes, sir. Can... You can see the screen now, right? Yes, sir. OK, so there is something you're going to do for me. and. Uh, the last time there was this error, I didn't know that the screen was not changing. So if per adventure, okay, let me just give it a try. Is it changing at your end also? No, sir. So it's just at the, uh, the, first, the first slide. slide in, yes, introduction to research methodology. Okay, no, so I have to just go back to, let me just go back to the, but what of like this? It's still not moving, sir. So still on the first um, introduction to research methodology. What of now? Yes, it has changed, sir. Okay, I just want to be sure because now I've come back to the layers and stuff. All right, so good evening and uh, thanks for joining. Unfortunately, I won't be able to annotate uh, with this kind of uh, presentation. I always like annotating. It helps me to pass across uh, some of the insights I um, make this a bit clearer. My name is Nii Itaou, like Johnson did say. And uh, I think going forward, uh, we have a team that will be handling or anchoring, you know, this series of research methodology classes. Uh, one of my colleagues, as uh, by name Favor, had insisted that I should try to like start off with the introduction to research methodology, which I'm going to do. What I have is just basically about 30 something slides. However, the presentation itself, I don't know if you can see it. The presentation itself is more than 400 slides. I'm talking of close to 444 slides. You know, so, and the presentation is uh, like a summary of research methodology. Research methodology as a course on its own can take years, you know, to be able to capture and to be able to fully understand. All we're trying to do is just an introduction, an emphasis on that term, introduction. You know, and uh, with what Chris, uh, Senator Chris said last time we met, it's something that's going to be like a recurring encounter. You know, if we start with this first encounter and we're able to tidy up this series of slides, you know, we are starting afresh again. You know, there's this repetition for emphasis to just allow people to grasp the basics. You know, and once you understand the basics, uh, definitely you'll be able to, uh, to grab the major one. All right, so I want to start with this uh, quotation from Albert Einstein. Uh, it's something that I love so much. Please, if peradventure you notice my slides are not moving, let me know so that I don't get carried away just discussing and then you're not following me. So Albert Einstein says something that any fool can know. 
You know, the point is to understand. I'm somebody who advocates for understanding, not just to know, but to understand. When you understand, there's a difference with knowledge. You know, when you understand, it is part of you. You know, you can quickly go through your notes now and grab something or cram them or just memorize them, and then you pour it out for your test or assignment or exam. But when you understand it, it's part of you. And that is the desire that I have whenever I'm talking about research methodology. You know, and by the way, uh, for today, we're just going to look at an introduction to research methodology, and then we'll talk a bit about research titles and uh, research questions. You know, if we can wrap up that much to tonight, I think that would be good. And then we can entertain some questions, uh, comments, and contributions. So all I'm trying to get across to us is to have that understanding, you know, that knowledge that gives you confidence. You know, when you know something, you are confident about it. I'm always excited when I hear people talking about research because, you know, it's an area of strength. And that is the desire for all of us in the clinical research group to get to that level where we can be strong in the knowledge of research. Aristotle also said something. He says, those who know, they do. But those that understand, they teach. And that is why I'm on this side of this platform. I'm the one teaching. But what I foresee, what I desire, what I hope will be happening in the next few months or so is that you will have been equipped you know, to the level that you also can teach. And that can only come with some requisite level of understanding. You know? And that is why whenever we are meeting on the bi-weekly meeting, you know, there's no point to be in a hurry. We are not rushing anywhere. It's not as if we are targeting an exam somewhere or we are targeting the, the end of syllabus somewhere. All we are trying to uh, ascertain is to give you an in-depth understanding of research methodology. You know, like I said, we might not be able to cover everything, but at least the little you know, let us know that you know it, and beyond knowing, you understand it. You understand it. Okay. So, what is research? I have about three definitions here. You know, and if you look at what I have here, it says in common parlance, it refers to a search for knowledge. A search for knowledge. Uh, the second one says a scientific and systematic search for pertinent information on the specific topic. And then you look at the third one, it says a careful investigation or inquiry, especially through search for new facts in any branch of knowledge. There is something that is reoccurring in all the, uh, what's it called, in all the three definitions I have on my screen here. And that is that there's a search for something. You know, so there's something hidden. I wouldn't use the word missing. There's something hidden, it is there. And you as a researcher, you are trying to bring it out into the open for us to know. And that which is hidden, if you look at the three uh, definitions, has to do with knowledge. So the knowledge is there. It's just that we have not accessed it. The knowledge is there. We have not accessed it. You know, and it can be in any branch or any field of knowledge. So we are trying to search for something. Looking at that second definition, it says there's a systematic search. So it's not haphazard. There is a format, there is a design, there is a blueprint, there is a path, there is a plan, there is a process, you know, a design via which you do or follow in accessing that knowledge. Look at this definition, and this is my own favorite definition, you know, and I want you to grasp this definition because this definition, you know, it encompasses most of the qualities of research. It says it's a systematic investigation, you know, designed to discover and contribute to a body of generalizable knowledge. So looking at the first uh, part of the definition, a systematic investigation. So it is something that has a plan, you know, a process, a, a pattern. It's not just haphazard, you know. Uh, I did give an example. I don't know if it was on this platform or somewhere. You know, you might be invited to a conference, possibly a medical students conference, a JUMSA or whatever uh, program like that. And you have many of your colleagues in our auditorium somewhere or in the conference room. And suddenly you thought of, ah, this is an opportunity. Why not just develop a questionnaire and circulate and get people to fill it and then you are done research? That is not a research. Because you have access to data or uh, potential respondents, does not make it a research. It's a systematic investigation. It's a process. And we'll see that process as we continue. And even despite the fact that it's systematic, there's a design that you have to follow, you know, such that whatever you are doing can be reproduced, can be replicated by somebody else. You know, and the whole essence of this design and this system is to discover, like I did say in the previous slide, is a search, is a search. You are trying to discover. So it's not as if it is missing. It is somewhere, you know, uh, hidden, but you are trying to unveil it. You know, you want to bring it that knowledge 
And that knowledge is supposed to contribute to a body of generalizable knowledge. So what does that mean? Let's assume I've done a study, I've done a research on a particular topic. And uh, let me use Senator Chris. Senator Chris is trying to do the same study, not knowing that I have done it before, you know, and is repeating exactly what I have done. What I have done is research. But if Senator Chris is repeating exactly what I have done, despite the fact that a systematic is designed, you know, and is designed to discover, but because it is not contributing to the body of knowledge, it's no longer research. You know, that's why if you want to do any study, you must spend some reasonable time online doing a literature review to be sure that you are not reinventing the wheel. You are not telling us what we already know. And I have come across so many people doing what has been done, spending a lot of money, a lot of time, energy, and all stuff. You know, so and the summary is that it's not research. Because after all said and done, you know, they cannot publish it. Nobody will accept to even have it as a presentation anywhere because you are telling us what we already know. We are not contributing to a body of knowledge. So please, very important, anytime you are doing research, ensure that there is a gap you are filling. So why do we do research? Many of us in our school, you know, to get our degree, you need to do research either individually or as a group. And I'm sure many of you, maybe after your first degree, you want to go into like a master's program, you know, want to go to a PhD program. Some of you want to do residency. All those uh, qualifications require a degree, you know, and for you to have, a, sorry, it requires a research for that degree. And um, that means that you must have some at least capability to be able to do research. So it's not something that is a choice. It's something that is compelling, something that you just have to. That's one reason why people do research. Another reason is the desire to face the challenge in solving the unsolved problems. There are many conditions still now that we still don't have our solutions to. I mean, many of you know that cancer, for example, cancer is a big problem that there's no solution to many of them. And in the US, as I talk to you, there's a crazy amount of funds, you know, dedicated to cancer research, all in the view to try and find out solutions to, because it's automatically like a death sentence. Uh, I don't know if you people had, we lost the chief of army staff in Nigeria, or the general, Lieutenant General, uh, something like Baja. You know, what killed him based on what I had was pancreatic cancer, you know, CA pancreas. And uh, for those of us in the medical field, you know that that thing is more like a death sentence. The only person that I know that has stayed long enough, more be like four or five years before uh, the person passed on, was Steve Jobs of Apple. And that's because there's crazy money to just prolong this life a bit longer. You know, so you can imagine it's a challenge. You might wake up tomorrow and you say, this uh, pancreatic cancer, what is the big deal? Let me see if there's something we can do. And then that's a challenge and you are dedicating your life, your energy, your time, your intellect in solving that. And that is to do research is in the intellectual joy of doing some creative uh, work. You know, I, I, I love research, it excites me. Whenever I'm doing research, talking research, or discussing research, there's this excitement I have, there's this fulfillment I have, you know, so that's part of the reason why I do research. For me now, there's no research degree that I'm looking for. I've gone to the zenith of my academic pursuits. I have a PhD, so I mean, what else am I looking for? Rather, let me just transcend, uh, transfer my insights to those of us who are trying to come up. And there's this desire to be of service to society. There's a problem, and then you are trying to be of help. You know, it's one of the reasons why we do research. When you do research and you have a lot of publication or you have some novel findings, you get respect. You know, people quote you. You know, they say, according to Titus Johnson, you know, 2024, he said so, so, and so. So there's this respect, you know, and frankly speaking, it's a sweet feeling. I, I happen to have been called out, you know, concerning some line of research I worked on in the past. And that was when I knew that, man, it's nice to, to be a researcher, not just a researcher, but somebody who has some reasonable uh, research finding. Uh, I did a study, and that study alone got me a trip to China. You know, everything fully paid to a five-star hotel, everything paid for, you know. And, uh, you know, when I remember those things, I said, wow. And I have seen people quote me severally, you know, based on my own findings, they quote me, and then they cite me as part of their own authorities in their own write-up, you know. And if you're in an academic pro uh, profession, maybe a research center or you're a lecturer. I don't know if you have heard about uh, publish or perish. You need research to get promoted. You know, when you have somebody who is called a professor, is a professor by virtue of the number of time spent 
uh, teaching students or lecturing students and the number of papers and research that has been done by such a person. So you need research for promotion, you need research for fame. That fame is similar to respectability. People respect you. You are an authority in your own field. When you talk, they have to listen. It's because, I mean, you have really added more knowledge you know, in your own field. For publicity, that's how people get to know you. you know? Uh, that particular stuff I spoke about, the invitation to China, you know, it was somebody that somewhere, maybe in South Africa or in the US, okay, the, the, the topic of research is the oral manifestations of HIV and AIDS. You know, it was just a Google search about somebody who has done something like that in the Africans. And then they found out that I've done a bit of work there and they looked at the work I've done and decided that it made sense. And that was how I was invited. So publicity, people get to know you all over the world, you know, by virtue of what you have done. There are people I have quoted, there are people that I have longed to meet physically by virtue of what they have done. I was so excited with the results that I've seen in their work. You know, so you want to be known uh, globally, do research, it will grant you that publicity. I'm not saying it will make you a celebrity, those are two different things, but it will make you a public figure in the academia, okay? And then for knowledge advancement, you just want to be part of knowledge, you know, increasing the knowledge around. So that's part of why we do research. So what is the importance of knowing how to conduct research? which I can say is part of the reasons why the, this club has been formed, this clinical research student club, you know, it's just for you to know how to do research. The knowledge of methodology provides good training. Can, can I pause here and ask if we're on the same slide and if you're hearing me, please? Yes, sir, I can hear you, sir. Awesome, awesome. And we're on here, in Puya. Beautiful, beautiful. So the knowledge of methodology provides good training, especially to the new research worker, and enables them to do better research. So all we are trying to do in this club is just to train ourselves. You know, it's like uh, an apprentice, a master apprentice relationship, where you all are like apprentices, you know, and then they, we have some masters, so to say, trying to pass down the skill, the insight, the knowledge for you to be able to get to the level where you yourself can end up being a master and repeating the same thing, you know. Knowledge of how to do research will inculcate the ability to evaluate and use research results with reasonable confidence. Part of the things you will learn in the course of this training is being able to read academic papers. You have research papers on all different fields because research papers are not ordinary papers. They are not like prose or fictions or poems. They are scholarly writings and there's a way research papers are written. If you don't understand research, you might not be able to enjoy or interpret or know the meaning of all those writers. So this will help you. And then helps you to make intelligent decisions concerning problems facing us in practical life at different points of time. So it's not only for us alone. It is research that our policymakers use to be able to decide on the next step. In, you know, either to take a step or not to take a step. You know, so they need to have our, our data or research results to be able to uh, take a step in the right direction for the benefit of the population. I'm introducing a terminology. No, I'm not introducing it. I'm going to be explaining a terminology which we are conversant with, and that is research method versus research methodology. I'm sure we'll have heard those two terms before, and maybe we think that they are the same thing, but no, they are not the same thing. And we are going to start our introduction deep in, with that, uh, with those terminologies. So you will hear the word research methods, and then you will hear another one, research methodology. The method may be understood as all those methods or techniques that you use for conducting your research. You know, if it's an epidemiological study, you know, where you can use questionnaires, interview observations, biomarkers, biosensors, all manners of stuff for collecting your data. It is the method you use, you know, in gathering your data. But it's not only, uh, it doesn't stop at that. It's actually a combination of three different parts that I was talking of research methods. You know, so number one is those methods that you use for the collection of data Number two is the method that you use uh, for analyzing those data. That was the statistical techniques to use for analyzing your data. And the third part are the methods which you use to evaluate the accuracy of the results that you have obtained. So when we say research methods, it is data collection analysis and the evaluation of those uh, results from your analysis. And those evaluation includes the use of uh, reliability scores and validity testing. You know, so that is research methods. And that is why when you are reading an academic paper, please listen carefully. When you are reading an academic paper, you know, there's a way it is structured from the title to the names of the authors, to the abstract, to the introduction. After introduction, what you see is research method. You don't see research methodology or research method, just note it. And then after research method, you have your result discussion, maybe conclusion, 
acknowledgement references and etc. You know, so note that in that research method portion of the paper, what we are seeing there is how the data was collected, how it was analyzed, and the method that they proposed to evaluate the accuracy of the results. So on the other side, research methodology now is a way to systematically, so it's an umbrella term, you know, to systematically solve the research problem. It may be understood as a science of studying how research is done scientifically. Science of studying how research is done scientifically. So it's an umbrella broad term, you know, that's methodology. In research methodology, there are many steps that we study, you know, that are adopted by a researcher in studying his research problem, along with the logic behind them, along with the justification, the reasons, the basis behind whatever method you are doing. And then we are, I'm going to explain it further as we continue. So this is just like a picture to show you that the research method itself, which is the circle there, is sort of embedded or is, uh, yeah, is embedded within the methodology. So the methodology is a broader term uh, that encompasses the research method itself, okay? When we say research methodology, we are not only talking of the research method, but we are also considering the logic. When I say logic, it's like the reason behind what you are doing, and that is the essence of understanding. You might want to do a study now, and then you are talking to me, and you are telling me you want to do a cross-sectional study, for example. My question is why cross-sectional study? Now, if you don't understand the basis for the use of a cross-sectional study, that means you are just guessing. You don't understand it. You just know it. Maybe your knowledge is because somebody has used it before. Okay? You might say you want to do maybe a chi-square to analyze your data, and I ask you why chi-square? So all we are trying to do in research methodology is for us to understand why you are doing what you are doing. You know, explain why we are using a particular method or technique and why we are not using the other one. So the research results are capable of being evaluated either by the researcher himself or by others. You know, so that is where we hope to get all of us to a place where you are saying what you are saying, not because you know it, rather, but because you understand it. You know, this is a simple thing. If you understand something, everybody can see that you understand it. There is no blabbing, there is no assumption, there is no actually, actually. You are just on point because you know what you are talking about. And that's research methodology. So you need to know why you are doing what you are doing and the basis for it. So in, in research methodology, you want to know why a study has been undertaken. You might want to do a study. I mean, you have a research topic in mind or a research title in mind, and then I ask you why. Why are you doing this study? You know, you and then you are saying, I'm, 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 then you don't have a study. You must have a basis. There must be a justification, a reason behind it. You know, and even how the precise problem was identified. In what way have you crafted the hypothesis? All these are part of what we'll be talking about as we continue. What data have you collected? What type of data have you collected? How did you collect it? You know, that is the particular method you use in your data collection. Why is a particular method or technique used for data analysis? You know, why not another method? And many other similar questions, you know, are usually answered when we talk of research methodology. You know, so I want you to imagine yourself like an oral examination. You have an idea and then you are sitting before maybe people like us. And then I'm asking you, why do you want to do this study? I mean, it starts like that. And then, okay, you have been able to tell me why. But why are you using this method for studying this study or for doing your study? Why this analytical method? Why this, why that, why this, why that? So you need to have the basis, the reasons, the understanding of what you are doing and why you are doing it, more importantly, why you are doing it. So there are some terminologies that I will just explain now. I've discussed what research methods are. I've discussed what the research methodology is. Then you'll have had again research approach research designs, all these are different terminologies, you know, and I'll just show some definitions to clear that. Like a research approach is the strategy, you know, or the plan uh, or the framework that you want to use to implement your plan. So we are going to discuss a research approach as we continue in this study, but just maybe as an intro, there are three approaches to research. It can either be quantitative, you know, qualitative or a mixture of the two, which we call a mixed method approach. You know, so uh, most of the time, those who are in the academia and the scientific field, you know, that deals with a lot of measurements, you know, a lot of things that you have to measure or count or whatever, that approach is more of the time quantitative. Like most of us being medical students and some of us also in the sciences, you know, the kind of study you'll find yourself doing will be quantitative. And then when we go to the social sciences, those like in the sociology, you know, in uh, education, in psychology, all those uh, social sciences, 
we are most of their kind of duty has to do with getting to know people's views, people's opinion, perception, attitudes, you know, things that have to do with explanation. You know, you are not counting their views. You are just trying to get their explanation. Those, those kind of approach will require you to do a qualitative because you are dealing with text, you know, and people's views more. And like I said, we'll discuss that. So there are situations where you need a mixture of the two. That is where the mixed method comes in. For the design, is a plan to answer your research question, you know, and even in the quantitative uh, study design approach, there are two cardinal research designs, two cardinal, you know, we have the observation, observational, and then we have the experimental. I'm not going deep into that, but it's just to let you know that that's the design. And under the observational and experimental, there are other uh, classifications under them, and it continues like that. So the method, like I told us earlier on, is the procedure selected by you, the researcher, to collect, analyze, and interpret. You know, those three, uh, those three parts of research method. Why the methodology is a way to systematically solve the whole problem. It's like the research process as a whole. You know, so please don't forget, these definitions can be confusing. They don't mean the same thing. By what I've just said now, you can see that there's a line of difference between all of them. So when we talk of the research process, it starts with formulating the title and question. You understand? You do a literature review when you realize that your title or questions are valid. What do I mean by valid? So you might have an idea at the back of your mind about a study you want to do. And then the first thing you do after crafting out a sample title or a topic, please listen carefully. The first thing you do, you know, is to do a literature review based on the topic you have in mind. You know, that is where you'll be shocked and surprised just to find out that what you are trying to do has been done. You know, that's why, you know, anybody that joins this number two, they run the risk of wasting their time, resources, energy, and money. So whenever you have a title or a question in mind, please go search and do an extensive search to be sure what you are doing is valid and, not, and still relevant. So after that, you do a literature review. Then once you are sure that, okay, you still have a case, you have something that is novel that you might want to still talk about, in case it's a quantitative study, that is where you need an hypothesis. We don't have hypothesis in qualitative uh, approach. You know, we only have a hypothesis in quantitative. And even in quantitative, there are some type of uh, research questions that don't require hypothesis. And we'll look at that as we continue. You know, I've, do, I've told you about your approach and the designs, that's the next step. And because we are in the quantitative part, you have to calculate the sample size, you know, that you need for your study. You don't have to work with everybody. You know, and there are ways of calculating that. There are a series of formulas. And now that you have the number you are working with, the next step is to uh, talk on how you are going to select those numbers from your studies population. You can't just pick them arbitrarily. You know, there are ways via which you will select. And part of the reason here is for the different ways, they have different rationale, they have different reasons. So you can't just select a study participant, you know, because somebody used the same method. You must have your own reason for why you are selecting that particular method. And then we have variables and measurements in research. These variables and measurements, to a large extent, they are a fallout of your literature review. Because that's where you get all the kind of things you need to add up in your questionnaire, your recording leaflets, you know, and how you are going to measure them. And then we go to your questionnaire design. That's where your variables will end up and how you are going to collect your data, different methods for that. And then you analyze your data, you interpret or uh, make your generalization. Then you report. You know, your data, either in the conference, an abstract, a paper, or a manuscript, you know, maybe a bounded report, whatever method you are going to report your finding, you know, putting in mind that all your research must have ethical background, you know, and after you are done, it, it's a cycle, you will continue again. So normally number one to number eight is what comprises uh, the proposal. You will hear about chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. So chapter one is basically uh, that maybe number one, and chapter two is uh, number two. And then from that three to eight is where you will have your chapter three. You know, that number three to number eight is where you have your chapter three. Your chapter four is actually number nine, which is data analysis. Chapter five is the number 10, you know, where you discuss your finding and all stuff. All right, so that is, so when we are talking about proposal writing, it's just a, a selection of some of these processes you know, that you now write. So this is what I was talking about the research process. And as you can see, it starts from identifying the problem number one, you review the literature, you have your questions and objectives and uh, hypothesis, you choose the study design and the approach to study design, you decide on the sample. Uh, even number four here is also part of where, okay, I think there's something missing between number four and number five. 
between number four and number five, you should be able to calculate your sample size, calculate your sample size, you know, and then it continues like that. You decide on the sampling design, how you select the sample, you collect your data, uh, processes, analyzing your data, write your report, and then it continues like that. It's a continuous circle. Okay, so I'm going to see how to change this particular research process to get one that is more encompassing. All right, so what are the problems faced by researchers? You are forthcoming or uh, researchers. When there's no training on research methodology, it's a big, big, big problem. I have been in research methodology for quite a while, and there's a big problem that I have noticed, and that is that many of the people that are trying to supervise, uh, what's it called, uh, that are trying to supervise students on research, themselves are ignorant of research methodology themselves. You know, so that becomes a huge problem. You can only give what you have. So when you don't have training, what are you going to give others? And so the uh, errors, the mistakes are perpetrated and repeated over and over. And then there's this other problem about studies overlapping one another. That's what I spoke about earlier on the people reinventing the wheel, doing what has been done. It's a big problem. And it's because people are lazy. They don't want to do a literature review. They end up doing what has been done. And after all said and done, it's a waste. You can imagine, sometimes the study can last a year or two years, only to realize that it's been done before. Then how do you make yours a bit novel? So please, like I said, after you have an idea, never overlook the aspect of literature review. Uh, I think uh, that literature review part is in the next class after today's class, maybe in the next two weeks, and it will be taken by favor, if I'm not mistaken. Lack of code of conduct for researchers, and there are many ethical things that we should put in mind. People just do research as if it's just something routine. There's a code of conduct. There's an expectation. I don't know if you have heard of some researchers whose publications have been withdrawn you know, by virtue of misbehavior, okay? And sadly, we have few mentors to raise those who are willing to be researchers. Very few of us are willing to do that. Many people are comfortable and okay with them just having the knowledge, you know, but I am hoping that you all will end up as mentors, you know, and then you pass the button down and it continues like that. You know, there are few mentors, you know, to raise researchers. There are people like all of you here, because you won't be here this at 8 p.m. or, I mean, this night, you know, for you to be hooked on to this Google team stuff is just an evidence that you are interested. And I'm telling you in all sincerity, that is the only reason why I am here, you know, to be able to at least uh, encourage your interest so that you don't let it fall down and die. You know, I want you to keep that interest burning. You understand? So that's just like a very brief introduction to research methodology. The next thing I will just talk about now is development of a research title and research questions. How do you develop a research title and research question? That development is like number one, uh, what is it called? Number one uh, stage, you know, in the, in the research process, identifying the problem. And that is similar to development of a research title and research question. So choosing the research, uh, what is it called? Choosing a research topic or title, it originates uh, with an idea about some general problem or question or inquiry or observation or something that is intriguing you. There must have been something that you have noticed. Like I said, many of you are medical students. You know, you will have noticed something maybe in the clinic, maybe in your lecture notes, maybe in your textbooks. There must have been something that you have wondered, but why, but why, but why? You know, it's an idea that has been like probing in your head. That is how it starts. Or you have been going to the clinic on ward rounds, or you are clinicking a patient, and then you have been noticing a pattern or something strange, something that you have not heard about before. You know, it comes like that. You know, it comes like a big problem. And then why you keep thinking or ruminating about that? It is narrowed down to something more researchable, something more specific, which will now be the central issue that you are trying to address. You know, so when we say a research topic, it's synonymous with a research problem. And it's still synonymous with a research question. Why am I saying that? You know, so let's say you have a research question. Most of the time, your research topic actually starts from a question in your mind. So it's the question that you're now rephrasing to a topic or a title. Like, why do people not come for regular checkup? Very simple uh, question. You know, why do people or patients not come for regular checkup? So it's a question. Now you will now like rephrase it back into a topic or a title, you know. Uh, possibly maybe the prevalence or the pattern of regular medical checkup among people or patients in a particular locality. 
Now you have rephrased your question back into a title. But sometimes it comes like a title from where you now have to like extract and bring out your research question. So the question is synonymous with the problem. So the topic broadly defines the area of research. I've just given an example of a topic now, you know, talking about maybe other, uh, maybe general body checkup or whatever, you know, but you cannot narrow it and narrow it and narrow it. Because if I just say, why do patients not come for checkup? Patients are massive. You have patients in different fields and different disciplines in medical line. You might want to do maybe ONG patients, you might want to do maybe uh, cardio patients, maybe uh, renal patients, you know, so that you understand. So you're not trying to bring it down, bring it down to a level that is feasible. Selection of a topic is the first major challenge in conducting research. Many of you might have gone uh, past through some lecturers who served as your supervisors, and they will tell you, go and bring three topics. <laughs> You'll be surprised that just generating three topics can take you three months. You will keep thinking and thinking and thinking, but there's really not a big problem there. I tell you in all sincerity and honesty, the reason why people don't have topics to work with is because people are not reading, especially scientific materials, you know? So it's difficult for them to just see a topic that is viable and valid. But if you are somebody who reads a bit of scientific stuff, you will realize that topics are everywhere. But there are no simple rules for selecting a research topic, but some considerations must be met for appropriateness. Number one, you need a broad familiarity with the field. Broad familiarity. You remember the definition of research. You are trying to search for some knowledge. You know, you can't just come into a field that is not your base, and then you want to, for example, I'm a dentist by training. You know, imagine me going to ONG, and I'm trying to do a research in ONG. Definitely, I'm going to mess up, because that's not my field. You know, the best I can do is to collaborate with a colleague who's in that field so that, I mean, we are able to do something that makes sense. And how do I have a broad familiarity? Even in my own field, like I said, once we have an idea of a topic, the next thing to do is a literature review, you know, to know what is already known in the field and to identify the areas that is not known. And that area that is not known is what we call the literature gap or gap in knowledge or knowledge gap. You will have had that time before, I'm very sure about that. It's a common terminology, knowledge gap, knowledge gap, you know, uh, it's something that will help you to identify a possible research topic. Sometimes, you know, you might need to discuss with people who have already gone ahead in that particular area. For example, I spoke about oral manifestations of HIV and AIDS. A colleague of mine some years back approached me interested in that field, you know, as we were discussing, I told him about the areas that had been worked on and the areas where more research is needed. So, it's because that has been an area we have spent a lot of time. You know, there is no point him wasting time doing what has been done. You know, but I just told you, why not focus on this area? This particular area, there's been little work done there. Let's look at your own uh, contribution in that field. So there's a difference between a research gap or a knowledge gap and a research problem. Recall that in the previous slide, I said a research problem is synonymous with a research question. So let's look at the research gap. This gap is the research problem that you discovered you know, after you have done a detailed literature review. So like you have a topic and you have gone online, you know, reading about that topic and you have found out that, okay, there are some things people have been saying about this particular topic uh, along the line. Ah, there's a particular area that nobody has even done anything. And you have searched and searched and searched and searched. And you realize that, ah, you know, nobody has even ventured into this particular area. That's a gap, that's a gap in, in knowledge. You know, and that's a research gap. So the research gap is a question or a problem that has not been answered by any of the studies that you have searched in your field. That has not been answered. Please, that is the key thing there. Because if it has been answered and you are repeating what has been done, it's a waste of time. That's no longer research. Usually, usually the research gap is what you now convert into an hypothesis, you know, for you to do your research. And when we get to hypothesis, we tell you how that is done. On the other side, the problem statement is a constructed sentence derived from the research gap, you know? So when you have uh, maybe a gap that you have noticed in your literature, there's a way you now present it as a problem statement. So that problem statement is actually the thing you are trying to find a solution for. I'm trying to think of something. I said earlier on that we were having a question about uh, why do people not come for a uh, regular checkup? You know, so let's assume that uh, we are looking at patients in the in the hypertensive clinic, the cardiology clinic, or whatever. You know, and 
you have been doing your literature review, you have seen that, okay, distance is a problem where people don't come from. A regular checkup, finances is another problem. Maybe people are forgetful, that's another problem. And you have been coming across all manners or people don't understand the instruction, that's another problem, you know? Or, and I mean, you, have, you can chronicle like 10 to 11 maybe reasons that are already existing in the literature. But maybe along the line, you, you have a weird thought that, what are the spiritual reasons? Maybe somebody, maybe they believe that if they come, whatever is not there, you'll be identified. Just, uh, I'm just like, a, it's just a high for example. Spiritual reason, you know, or uh, a taboo that if they come, they will find a, a problem with their heart. And you realize that that has not been worked on. So that's the level, your research gap. You now convert it into a problem that the inability or the lack of ass assessment of the spiritual aspect of people's perception of clinical care is something that might worsen their head. Because if that is not taken care of and you spend a lot of time on the other side without considering the spiritual part, you know, the wholesome treatment you are trying to offer is still at a, at a loss. So that is now a problem. You have identified a problem and you have uh, tied it or phrased it alongside the research gap. So that is how it is done. You have a gap and then you bring out how the gap is a problem. And your whole research is actually to find a solution to that problem, which after you have done, you have contributed to the body of knowledge. That's just that. There are two types of problem. It can be a problem that relates to nature or a problem that has to do with relationships between variables. So the one I've given an example earlier on is just more like you know the problem in nature, the problem in nature. But there's a way you can craft it to make it sound like a problem with relationship. For example, you can say that how does you know spiritual perception of a cardiology patients you know impede, affect, impact, correlate, associate whatever terminology you want to use with their uh, overall health uh, situation, whatever. So there's a way you can relate it. You know, and I will show us some terminologies that we can use in constructing such questions. So when you want to get a topic, make sure number one that it's something that you are interested in over a long period of time. What do I mean? You know, don't just pick a topic because somebody gave you a topic. Pick a topic because you are interested in it. And uh, I recall one of my professors once told me to do a study on malaria and candidiasis. And I can tell you how hard that all my life till tomorrow, I hate anything to do with malaria. You know, the guy wanted me to work. There was some funding, some grants, but it was for his own excitement. I don't like anything to do with malaria. You know, so no matter the amount of uh, encouragement or enticement, no, I'm not interested. So if you are doing a research, pick a topic that you are interested in and it will last, because research can take a long time. And if you are not interested, you easily get bored and tired and you, you abandon it. Avoid a topic that is beyond you. Cut your coat according to your size. I wanted to do a study some years back and I was planning to do a study for to cover the uh, north central part of Nigeria. That's about seven states. You know, thank God I have a very good supervisor. The man just insisted that no, hold on and work with only one state. It was when I started I realized that wow, I wouldn't have been able to do anything from beyond one state. So don't be overly ambitious. Do something that's small. Narrow down your work to one small level where you are sure you can cover up. And like I keep emphasizing, ensure that your topic has potential to make original contribution, original means novel, new, you know, ensure you, you need a topic that will be telling us something new. I don't know how to emphasize that. Don't repeat, uh, reinvent the wheel, tell us what is new. And you can do that after you have identified the gaps in literature, the knowledge gap, okay? And then which aspect of your discipline interests you? That number five can be tied to number one, you know? Many of us are in the medical field, you know, and the medical field has many disciplines. Somehow, somehow, as you are going higher in your class, there will be some areas that will be interesting to you. Some of you will like orthopedics, some, some people will like dermatology, ENT, ophthalmology, you know, different field, maybe hepatology, you know, or, uh, gastroenterology, you know, just any field that will just be having some interest to you. Some of you will like children, pediatrics, you know, or maybe pregnant women, ONG. Some of you will like the psychiatric uh, cases, you know, neurology, urology, you know, all manners. So there will be an area that's of interest to you. That is an idea of an area you should be picking a topic from so that it can be sustained for a long time. Ask your question, this question, when you are trying to get a, a topic. Has such research been done by others? You cannot say yes or no on your own. It is until you have a literature review, you know, extensive one, before you can answer that number one question. Can the study you are proposing be done using appropriate research methods? Yes or no, if no, then jettison it. Because if it's beyond you, there's nothing 
And there are some studies that maybe the easiest way to get them done will require you to do some sequencing on genomic stuff. You don't have access to that now, except you have access to them. You know, and there are some that you require an electron microscopy to be able to check what you are looking for. So look at your availability of uh, material, things that you have access to, you know, before you conclude on doing something. Don't start what you cannot finish. It's a common uh, parable, uh, proverb that I give people. Don't start what you cannot finish. There is no, the best research <clears throat> are the ones that you finish. Did you have just said, the best research are the ones that you can finish. You might have a beautiful idea and you start and get stuck. That's not a good research. The best research are the ones you can finish. Look, ask your question, will it stimulate interest by others and the sponsor? Sometimes you need funds to do your research, you need grants, you need the uh, support. And people giving money, they don't give money for everything. Normally they give money for some selected areas. It might be river blindness, it might be maybe oral health. But sponsors always have particular areas of interest. So look at your area of interest. Does it align with the sponsor's interest? Very important. Is your research feasible? Is this something you can do? Is it practicable? You know, you need to answer that question. Do you require, are the, the, are the required capacities available in your team or institution, or even if they are not available, can you access them or can you acquire them if you have enough money? I said something earlier on, and I want to do a study among O and G patients. You know, do I have an O and G specialist that will be pairing with me, collaborating with me? You know, so if you don't have the necessary capacity, there's no point. You can't do it. You can't be reporting on something that is not your field. It won't sell. Who is likely to be interested in supporting it? That's your study. That you can also find out from a good search. And is there any benefit in it for me? We said earlier on those things about why people do research for degree program, respectability, for fame, for publicity, for intellectual joy, plenty of things. So even if you are doing the study, what is it? What's in it for you? You understand? Are you doing it to have your degree? So there must be something that will also spur you in so that you don't just abandon it halfway. Developing the question, every research, like I said, will begin with a question derived from a topic that captures your interest. I think that's I've said earlier on, you know, there must be a question, you know. It's just the basis, like a foundation. And that question is the uncertainty about something the population does. You, the investigator, wants to resolve by making measurements or by observing your study participants, okay? And that research question is a question relating to a particular aspect of your research topic. People usually have challenges transforming an idea into a question, and that I have witnessed time and time over. You know, you have a good idea, now crafting it into a question becomes a problem. Most research questions almost always involve relationship between two or more variables, phenomena, concepts, or ideas. You know, that's where this kind of terms will come in. What is the association? between age, you know, and productivity. What is the relationship between being female, you know, and be having a first class assessment? What is the effect of sleeping early on academic performance? What is the probability that if I don't come to the clinic in a year, I will remain healthy? What are the chances? You know, all manner, I'm just giving you random questions, you know, of it. So those terminologies, association, relationship, predictability, risk, likelihood, correlation, association, you know, all these things are, are terms that normally come up when you are crafting a good research question. And the question can be descriptive or inferential. Now, when we say a question is inferential, that is when it relates with two or more variables. But a descriptive question defines the variables you know, as a group. What is the educational attainment of the parents of maybe a medical student, not really Yahoo boys, it can be anything. What is the pattern uh, distribution of COVID among you know, a particular location? What is this? What is that? What is the prevalence of this? What is the pattern of this? You know, what is the distribution of that? That's a descriptive question. You know, but the moment you start having all these uh, terms, or association between this and that, relationship between this and that, effect of this on that, chances of this on that, predictability, anytime you start having questions like that that have this kind of terms, we call them inferential questions. You know, does parents' financial status relate to students' academic achievements? So put in another way, what is the relationship? between parents' financial status and students' academic. So you can see there are two different variables, you know, financial status of parents and students' academic achievement. That makes it inferential. Now, going a step forward, a descriptive research question does not have an hypothesis. You only have hypothesis for inferential research questions. Don't forget that. You only have hypothesis for inferential research questions. Your question needs to be relevant, you know, that's the whole essence of your research. 
because your research is answering that research question. If the question is not relevant, there's a waste of time. It needs to be interesting, capture the attention of people. People will be interested in what you are talking about. You should be focused and specific. I said it earlier on that you should not be too cut your coat according to your size. You know, the question should not be too broad or vague. You can, however, begin with a broad question and then you narrow it to something specific. Okay, you can narrow question down by particular aspect, a particular time, you know, maybe you want to, uh, there's a study instead of doing over 10 years, you just want to do last year, just one year, a particular event, a geographical area, instead of Nigeria, you can just pick a state, instead of a whole state, you can pick maybe one local government area. I mean, you narrow it down to something that is within your group, maybe age group, instead of doing everybody, okay, you want to just work between those between age 35 and 44 years, you have narrowed it down. So try and make your question specific. This is an example of a broad topic that is narrowed and narrowed down to a research question. Number one, you're interested in women's health. And then, okay, you narrow it further to women and cancer. And then you further narrow it out to women smokers and breast cancer. And then you ended up with a research question. Is there an association between cigarette smoking and breast cancer risk? I can, I, I can narrow it more. Maybe among civil servants in maybe Lagos, Lagos State or a part of Lagos State. So you can further narrow it down, you know, till you have something you can work with. Look at number two, eating disorders is another example. Teenagers and eating disorders, teen peer pressure and bulimia. What role, if any, does peer pressure play in the development of bulimia among teens in a particular university, in a particular high school? You get a point in a particular state. So you can narrow it down to something that is doable within your reach. For clinical kind of uh, research questions, there's something we call PICO, P-I-C-O. You know, it helps you to focus your question. Look at this example. In patients with chronic back pain, you have identified the patient or problem. And then the eye's intervention would provide in a 30 minutes massage, as well as rubbing of a heat bump. You know, then you go to the comparison. When compared with rubbing of heat bump alone, you know, lead to less pain and improved function. So if you look at the purple font, just let's read the purple font alone. Then you will see uh, the research question. In patients with chronic back pain, would providing a 30 minutes massage as well as the rubbing of a heat bump when compared with the rubbing of a heat bump alone lead to less pain and improved function? You get the point. Maybe I can now say, maybe in just university teaching hospital, I have limited it to a particular location. You get the point. So the PICO there is just used to narrow down the question. Now, it is not only PICO that we have, there are many formats. Like I said, it's just an introduction. And it gives you an idea when you see other formats of. Uh, clinical question stuff, it's, you know that it's just an example. So put that in mind. Now, there's something you need to know that if your research question is well crafted, it will suggest to you the most appropriate study design that you will undertake to answer the question. When I say good study design, okay, let me just go back. For example, looking at this, uh, what's it called? This research question now, definitely it's going to be an experiment from the research question itself. It's going to be an experiment where you have, you know, those who are having heat bump, heat bump, and those who are having an extra 30 minutes massage, and you're trying to see if there's going to be less pain and improved function from the two groups. So if a research question is well stated, it's going to grant you an idea on how you are going to, what's it called? How you are going to undertake the study. It will also guide you to the appropriate type of statistical test. And for you to know the kind of test you are going to do, definitely that sort of research question will help you know the kind of data you will collect very important, you will know the kind of data to collect, you know? So uh, whenever you are uh, crafting a research question, let it be formulated as a question, not a statement. And when you say as a question, don't make it a question that you can answer yes or no to, you know? Avoid question that does, or are, uh, you know, does heat balm reduce back pain? You end up saying yes or no, that's not a good research question. A good research question should be open, such that you now have to work on it, analyze, do your hypothesis to be able to arrive at a question that you can work with. If you ask me, I will say that this is a good place to stop, you know, for, for today. And uh, for the next class, I would like to take questions and comment and whatever. For the next class, we'll be talking about literature review, which is just a function of a continuation of the research process. So I don't know if it is Senator Chris or Titus Johnson that. I will hand over to to handle the part of what is it called?